And now, please welcome Gianni Russo. I've had one of these before. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Oh, it's afternoon now, right? So uh, to me, it's morning. I get up every day at 12. But anyway, here we are. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of shift gears a little bit, uh, putting the bumper together, getting uh, some of your vocal performances. Uh, thank you, thank you. I mean, lessons, trained. I mean, do you consider yourself a singer that acts or an actor that sings? Well, I, uh, fortunately, I made a, a movie called The Godfather 50 <laughs> years yeah, ago. I get you. And I can't believe it's 50 years. Wow. We, I finished it past uh, August, and then... Uh, I, I released an album just before doing that because I always wanted to sing to answer your question. Yes. And Sinatra heard it. And he said, what do you think, you Wayne Newton? What is that? In fact, it's, it's for sale right now on, on, on uh, JohnnyRusso.com. It's called uh, Time for Giving. And then I listened to it. It was so nasal and all. So he said to me, why don't you let me give you singing lessons? I said, what? And I went to his house and he gave me singing lessons. And in fact, it's, it's part of the album now. And uh, from that day on, then I actually became a singer. And How was he like to work with as a vocal coach? Was it very demanding or he just kind of brought out your natural talent? Well, it was a funny story because when I called Dorothy at the office, she said, yeah, okay, he's come Tuesday in Palm Springs. Because he's in Vegas. I was with him, actually. And she said, make sure you bring your bathing suit. I said, I don't want to learn how to swim. I want to learn how to sing. So I said, okay. So now they call me from the house and said, he's going to get up in about an hour, come here at 2 o'clock, bring your bathing suit. <laughs> I said, what is this with this bathing suit? So I get there, and I didn't bring a bathing suit because I didn't want to go swimming. So Henry says to me, do you have your bathing suit? I said, no, what's with this bathing suit? So go in the back in the cabana, put one on, and he'll be right out. He comes out with a cup of coffee and a robe on. He's getting the pool. I said, what's with the pool? He says, get in the pool. You want me to teach you to sing? So I get in the pool, and he, he says, submerge yourself. And he times me. And I said, what are we doing? He says, to learn to sing, you have to expand your diaphragm and your lower diaphragm. It's all about breathing, which is true. I said, how'd you learn this? He said, he learned this from Tommy Dorsey when he used to sing with the big bands because the guy could sustain a note. He never knew what he was breathing. And that's the whole thing. I mean, even, even my speaking voice has been lowered from that because I'm speaking. I could talk to you all day and do this and yeah. nothing happened. If I was speaking from my voice, wow. it would rattle. So that's what I did. And I became a singer, fortunately. I made a few dollars doing it, too. I'm still doing yeah. it, actually. A little, a little bit about the video, the one night only. What's the story behind that? Oh, that was at uh, Mohegan Sun. Uh -huh. It's from my book. I have a best-selling book out now, two and a half years, called Hollywood Godfather, My Life in the Movie and the Mob. And uh, they're making a 10-hour miniseries out of that now, too. So that's uh, great. And Paramount right now, I don't know if you're aware of it, they have a... a a 10-hour miniseries going on, and we were just looking at some of the shots, Mark and I, of the kid that's playing me, which is interesting, <laughs> that now I'm a character in a movie, so it's been a great run. And uh, so it's been good, I mean, fortunately. When, when does that air? When do you think that comes out? Uh, it's coming out, a lot of things are coming out. March 14th, 2022 is the actual 50th anniversary when the movie was released. Mm -hmm. We wrapped 50 years ago this past August, mm -hmm. which is, uh, unfortunately, I've done 49 motion pictures wow. since then. That won nine Oscars, and I produced 16 of them. <laughs> so, so what do you do in your spare time? <laughs> uh, I, 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 this is my clothing line, La Cosa Mia by Gianni. I'm writing three more books, fortunately. And I'm doing a rap album right now. Which is insane. Really? really? I'm in the studios Mondays and, and uh, Thursdays, four hours a day with Sony. Mm -hmm. And I'm working with a guy I never, when he called me, I thought, who's this guy? His name is Arsenic. <laughs> but he happens to be a multi-platinum producer in rap. And he's producing it. So, 
when, when uh, you're working on that currently? Right now. Right now. It comes out. It drops midnight on Sony throughout the world. Wow. And it's Hollywood Godfather sings The Godfather. So. What, what brings you more joy, the singing or the acting? I like just getting up in the morning. If I'm up, I'm, what do you want me to do? Sing? <laughs> I don't care. This, this Sunday, I'm actually here for my 79th birthday, oh. December 12th. Congrats. And I feel, you know, blessed even saying I'm 79. When people just say, guy's 60. I say, he's an old man, that guy. <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, so my, my life is a dream, actually. And uh, I've been blessed because people like yourself and, and inviting me at this convention. I've been traveling the world all my life, even before I became an actor. And, but now to get paid to do it, wow. <laughs> Yeah, if you don't mind, before we go to questions, I just have been really wanting to to ask you a few things. Just uh, for example, like with The Godfather, I mean, what kind of acting training did you have? What was it like to work with some of the actors there? My wife, believe it or not, she never saw The Godfather before. I made her watch it last week. She became absolutely enamored. Well, you know, that's the good news about the film because even I, I'm fortunate. I have uh, nine sons, two daughters, ten grandsons, so I've been introducing this film. My oldest son is 56, and my grandson is like three months. So I keep, when they're 14, I sit them down, and we could watch the movie together. But it's a movie that really stands up. It's absolutely. It, it, you know, there's a lot of old movies. You, you know, they're old, and it really doesn't hold your interest as much as this movie. I mean, again, to do a movie like that, I invested $35,000 when, when it, they needed money, wow. which has been ridiculous because we've done three and a half billion now in sales in 73 countries. Not that I got that, but wow. I got a small piece anyway. But, uh, oh, it's been a, a great run. And I never thought the movie would even come out, to be honest with you. Really? Well, they kept saying they're going to fire Francis. I mean, if you read, there's so many books. Friend, there's a book out right now. It's already a bestseller. It's, it's called... Uh, Take the cannoli, uh, leave the gun, take the cannolis by Mark Seal. Okay. Uh, great writer for Vanity Fair. But it, it's a, a film that, like I said, it just has such great legs and just keeps on going, fortunately. And um, so I've been blessed that way. And I'm blessed in every way. Kids, my life. I have all my hair. I mean, what am I doing here? I don't even know. So yeah. ba back to acting, though. As, uh, what was it like working with the cast and what kind of training did you have? I had no training at all, and, uh, and I, I almost lost a job because when they gave the first call sheet for you who are not in the business, you get one of these sheets under your hotel room every day telling you what time the car's going to pick you up, where you're going. And the first day, and it's ironic because I live on 61st Street in New York, and they were housing all of the celebrities at the Park Lane on 59th Street. So they didn't get me a room, so I called Paramount. I said, I want to stay there. They said, you live two, doors, two, <laughs> two blocks away. I said, I want to be where the stars are. They had an idea. I already had a 65 Bentley driven by a Chinese chick, nice chick. In fact, I gave it to Marlon Brando. He took it to Tahiti after the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to be a part of a movie star. Yeah. I was 25. I wanted to get up every day and go out, you know. And uh, the first day on the set, and they said, you know, I, I never heard of Pacino. He did one movie, Panic in Needle Park. I just heard of Jimmy Kahn because he had a great uh, TV show, Brian Piccolo, mm -hmm. which was a big nice. movie. And um, obviously Marlon Brando, Sterling Hayden, Richard Conti, they were all great actors. I knew them. So, and at the bottom of the call sheet, it said, no eye contact with Marlon Brando. Don't approach him. Don't talk to him. It's okay. So I'm sitting there. We had our first rehearsal. And they had Italian food. And Coppola, the director, his idea was, you know, to have all the Italians exaggerate your mannerisms, your hand gestures. Because all the non-Italians have to become Italian in the next two weeks. Like, nobody knows that, you know, Brando is Polish. <laughs> Jimmy Kahn was Jewish. They had to become Italian. So we did this for about a half hour, 45 minutes, and there's a break. And here comes Marlon Brando. 
comes walking over to me. I said, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. So he says, uh, you're a big TV actor. I said, no. Oh, and let me stress this, which is really important. I was already wearing Brioni suits. Okay. Diane Keaton came with combat boots, dirty jeans. <laughs> I mean, these, these new actors, I like the old actors. You know, everybody dresses well. I, that's why you want to become a movie star. Today, they're in camouflage. When I meet Bobby De Niro, he comes in a disguise. I have to say, what are you wearing today? He's got a beard, glasses, he's nuts. Long story short, he says, you're a big TV actor. I said, no. He says, uh, you got a big movie coming out. I said, no. He said, well, you're not on Broadway. I know everybody on Broadway. He says, who'd you study with? I said, what are you talking about? Study what? And with this, he calls Coppola over. He says, he's playing my son, Carlo. He says, yeah, and, and Coppola wasn't happy with me at all because he couldn't fire me, he didn't hire me. I didn't, if you read my book, you find I, they had a lot of problems with the labor in New York and I straightened that out for them through my stepfather who happened to be Frank Costello, who, could drive, <laughs> okay. who controlled all of New York yeah. and a lot of other places. So with that said, he calls Coppola and he says, this guy gets my oldest son killed, gets my son Michael involved with the family, he undermines us to the Barzini family. He's got to be a great actor. You should rethink this. <laughs> now, I already told everybody I was in the movie, and everybody's, how are you in this movie? You're not an actor. And if I wasn't in this movie, I would never be able to go back to the neighborhood. They all thought I was lying. So I didn't know the protocol on, on a set. I dismissed the director. You can't dismiss the director, not even in a rehearsal. I said, Francis, go over there for a minute because I didn't want to embarrass him and, and Brando. And they said, you know, don't look at him. I put my arm around him because we were in Patsy's 119th Street and there happened to be a Zig and Ed game up there all the time. And I used to bring overnight loans when they needed 5,000 or 10,000 for my father-in-law and, and bring it up to him. So I knew the place well. In the back room was a, a room that was not being occupied during the day. So I put my arm around Brando <laughs> And I walk them back there, and everybody's like silent now. Because all these stars are sitting around the table, and they say, who is this guy? And Brando's coming with me. So I get him out of earshot, and I said, let me just tell you something. I'm cleaning this up for the ladies in the room. I said, let me tell you something. You screw this up for me. Listen to me. You screw this up to me. I will suck on your heart. If you get me fired, you're dead. <laughs> He steps back, <laughs> and he said, that's brilliant. You could really act. He thought I was acting. I meant it. Was he nuts? I got, at 25, forget oh. about it. So he became my first acting teacher, Marlon Brando. Every day while Dick Smith was doing three hours, creating him as, you know, Marlon Brando, I mean, uh, Don Corleone, I was in there running lines. In fact, the day I did the, my death scene, yeah. which I think was the only scene I really acted in, the rest was all physical and fights. But when Pacino came in and Brando said to me, you already know you're dying, you read the script. He says, how are you gonna let the world know on a 36 inch, 36 foot screen? Because they know, and you got a close up on you. You have to be really good at this. I said, well, make me good. <laughs> but he was the one that taught me. He said, when Pacino hands you the ticket, what are you going to do with it? I said, I don't know. He said, I want you to sneak a look. It's like a security blanket where if you see the ticket, maybe you think you're not going to die because you know who these guys around you are, killers. He went through all of that. So the day of shooting, it was just the people in that room and Mike was the only other star there. And here comes Brando on the set. And, and, and as you're a cast member, you get a number. So when people hear the walkie-talkies in parking lots, they don't hear people's names. So they say, what's number one? What's number one doing on the set? He's not on the call sheet today. And we all know that. And, and Brando said, I know I'm not working. I came here to help this kid. And he was there, spent the whole day with me. And Pacino, everybody was saying, who are you? Why is this guy here? But that was my only acting teacher. 
my only singing teacher was Frank Sinatra. Wow. And the rest of it, I don't know anything, so. <laughs> I, before, before we get to your question, did they use a, any kind of stunt double for you uh, during any of this? They had a, a stunt double for the part of the fight scene only, because okay. of the union's law. Mm -hmm. But going through the windshield, that was the easiest scene for me, because Clemenza pulled me up, and we all know the configuration of a car in the back seat. I just rested my back on the top of the seat and started kicking. <laughs> How many takes what did they do on that? Do you have oh, any? we did a lot of takes because Francis being the genius that he is, he had the camera mounted on the hood. Right. And, uh, and he wanted that glass to break and those old windshields had plastic in them. Mm -hmm. So then they, just, they, had, they were ready for it. They had uh, lead and steel sole shoes made and they scored the windows in the corner because we did it so many times, I was kicking and kicking and kicking. In fact, every once in a while, I still find glass in my shoes. It's crazy. <laughs> I, got, I got a question for you over here. What kind of fallout did you experience after filming The Godfather with such, you know, you were great, but such an unlikable character that got Sonny killed and, oh and God, yeah. turned against the family? What, you know, in, in your personal life, you know, did people recognize you on the street? What, what happened? Well, the first experience I had of being an actor and how people really believe things, I was in Chicago performing at the Blue Max Room. And after that movie, I was getting dates everywhere because Carla from The Godfather, you know. <laughs> and I'm walking down on Rush Street, and this lady yells from across the street, she said, Carlo. I'm saying, okay, yeah, I, you know. She comes running over and starts beating me with this handbag. And the police saw it, grabbed her, and they said, Mr. Russo, you want to press charges? I said, no. I said, what's the matter with you? And she started crying hysterical. Her husband beat her, and she had a miscarriage. And she never got over it. But talking about art imitating life, I mean, anytime you people yelled, call it from that one, I went the other way. <laughs> No, but it's funny how people, you know, think you're that character, but it's crazy. The only, the only person I still don't get along with, don't even like him, is Jimmy Kahn. What a jerk. I mean, every other actor, this is the most pompous guy in the whole world. I can't believe it. And, and I say it publicly all the time, because why not be nice? First of all, we're lucky to be in the business. Be appreciative. And if you have an audience that wants to say hello to you, say hello to them. It's stupid. But um, that's the only bad experience I really had. And, and it was that. After that, then you, you learn, you know. Uh, what do you want to talk to me about? <laughs> Before we get to the questions from the audience, what was the premiere like? Uh, well, the premiere for me was, um, which is in my book, I, there was a warrant for my arrest. So I... <laughs> They were waiting for me to come to New York, <laughs> and I figured, so I, and they had a room for me at, at the St. Regis Hotel, where the, the big party was afterwards, and so I stood at the Warwick Hotel, and this is before 9-11, you can get on a plane as Mary Jane, they didn't care who you were, so I flew in that morning, everybody's looking for me, I had the FBI, CIA, I mean, everybody, I mean, read the book, you'll know why, there was like 23 in the indictments for me and um, my life has been very colorful so that's why the book is called <laughs> yep. Hollywood Godfather my life in the movie and the mob but um, but I wanted to go to the premiere so I had my tuxedo on and a coat and all that and I walked over to I, I stayed at the Warwick because it's right on 6th Avenue so it was right between the Paramount and the St. Regis so when all the people, you know, and uh, Army Archer was on one sidewalk doing a sh live show, and Merv Griffin was broadcasting live on the other side, and there was thousands of people, and I wasn't going to miss this. So I come out of the crowd, and, I, and the, the police see me. I say, I'm supposed to be on the red carpet. And they say, oh, yeah, let him throw. And ladies and gentlemen, Johnny Russo. And I'm seeing all the cops looking, where is he? <laughs> And I'm waving, and I knew they weren't going to stop that. They're filming it all. As soon as I get into the theater, I go right out the exit door. And I hide again. Then I go back to the St. Regis Hotel, 
which I wanted to be there because uh, Henry Kissinger was there. I mean, everybody was there. Ali McGraw. I mean, every, every major movie star. And Andy Williams sang Speak Softly Love for the first time with lyrics. So it was, I wanted to be there. So I went to all kinds of pictures. And again, I went through the kitchen, out the door, and went to the airport. See you later. They couldn't catch me. Forget about that. They didn't ever catch me, actually. So it's, um, oh, there she is. How are you, my darling? She likes my shoes, this girl. <laughs> oh, those are, oh, my God, those are great shoes. Yeah. She, she, uh, these are my, my shoes, too. I make them in Spain. And one of the brands is La Cosa Mia by Gianni. But um, I have people like me for strange reasons. Shoes, scarves. It's <laughs> Whatever it is, longer to make money. I got a lot of kids to feed. You want to get some questions from you guys in the audience? Got a question right there. Right here. Once again, thanks for doing this. This is so great having you here. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you all for inviting me. I wanted to ask you about the movie you did, Lepke, with Tony Curtis. How was that experience? That was a great experience because um, that's a great question, too. Because Albert Anastasia, as you know, I played Albert Anastasia. His brother, Tony, was my godfather. Jeez. <laughs> We were together downtown with, with, uh, with the real people, with Mr. Gambino. I used to see him every Sunday. And I came out of Precious Blood Church, and I saw Tony Anastasia. He was the head of the International Longshoreman. His brother was already massacred at the Park Sheridan in 1948. So I knew of him, and we were talking, and he says, I just I should go to church. I said, yeah. He says, uh, did you receive your you know, confirmation yet? Because I was only at 14. I said, no. He's wanting to let me be your godfather. I said, really? And that was it. So he became my godfather. So me doing that with Tony Curtis and Milton Berle was very funny. It was a great movie. I really enjoyed that. But that was my third movie after The Godfather. But uh, it really was. Uh, and, and, and I have a, a podcast. I don't know if you know that. It's on the same thing as my book. It got like 150 hours up throughout the world called Hollywood Godfather Podcast. And I, I had a lot of questions about that movie. It's still another good movie that stands up with Lepke. He played Louis Bookhalter. And I played Albert Anastasia, which I loved. I shot machine guns all the time. It was fun. <laughs> were, were there any, with all of the, the Hollywood mobster movies that have been made over the years in your opinion which one or ones do you feel are the most authentic i like the old ones with cagney you know and george raft and them and de niro did a great job with uh capone when he played al capone i mean there's some good ones out there and my one of my closest friends is uh you know uh bronx tale so he's uh he, he, when, in fact, he's, he's directing three of my ten. Nick Vallelongo, who wrote and won the Oscar for Green Book, he wrote all the hours, and uh, now he's given them to a George, uh, another guy, George Gallo, from Midnight Run and 29th Street. So well, I'm really happy to have these kind of people interested in my life and be directing. So, But, we, you know, that, those, that was, Bronx Tale was a great movie. And there's some good ones out there, but I mean, uh, selfishly, I think Godfather 2 mm -hmm. was better than Godfather 1 because the trilogy and seeing chronologically how he became it was more imp impressed with me. So in Godfather 2, was that a flashback or was that new footage you did? No, the, I, again, not being an actor, they, and we didn't know the movie was even going to come out. Paramount was threatening to pull the plug. So I got more money for that one day <laughs> than I did for the three months from the first one. <laughs> but it was good. I'm going to take a sip of water. While you're having a sip of water, I know that, you know, uh, Sinatra helped you sing and Brando helped you act. Who helped you write? Did you have any help with writing your, any of the books? Uh, as far, I'll, I'll let you finish, let, get your drink okay. and then, uh, and by the way, if you guys have any questions, I mean, we could talk to them all day, but we want to make sure we'll get you right after this uh, Right yeah, anyway, I, I'm here. Where am I going? We're, we're sitting here. Let's talk. Anyway, um, what was the question? The question was who helped, who helped you write? Who, uh, you know, who was some of your uh, 
influences and, and uh, used, like I'm saying. Just I, I wrote this book in 95, and the reason I wrote it, and we're probably all going through it with our kids and grandchildren, all my kids are always facing down. They're not paying attention to nobody. They're on their pads, they're on their phones, and nobody's talking, nobody's socializing. And they really don't have an ambition. The last sentence in my book is, yes, you can. The first, well, in 1949, I got polio, and I was subject and confined to Bellevue Hospital for five years, which was a mental institution. And I was part of Jonas Salk's experiment for the Salk vaccine. So this is my second pandemic, fortunately. And I was a little leery, like most of us were. How did they get a vaccine in three months? This one took three years. So from that and just my experiences in life, and I wrote this book to get my kids motivated somehow. And the last sentence in the book is, yes, you can. If you read it, you can understand. I mean, I mean I, I'm saying this publicly because it's in the book. The IRS, I had 23 federal indictments just for income tax evasion. And they said I, I, I made somehow $800 million, which I laundered through the Vatican. And I said, but where is the money? <laughs> they keep getting mad at me. They can't do nothing now. And the only reason I wrote the book most of the things I did in my younger age, the statute of limitations are over. <laughs> okay. We got a question for you right here. Oh, please. I was curious if uh, anybody knew uh, Brando's intentions to uh, refuse the os Oscar and uh, if, if you had any conversation. Yeah, I was sitting with him. I became really close to him. No, I, I became really close to the guy. And uh, in fact, I bought a house next to him and Jack Nicholson up on Mulholland, which was the biggest mistake I ever made. These guys, two or three o'clock in the morning, think of nothing blowing their horn in your driveway. <laughs> but we, I mean, I really, really liked him. And, and we became friends, as I said, and I really did give him this girl. And, uh, but Brando, to me, and, and and, and those experiences were amazing to me. You know, so it's, uh, how, how do you, you know, even to, to say that Brando's my friend until he died. In fact, I remember vividly Michael Jackson in the summer calling me, screaming with his little high voice, we killed him, we killed him. I said, who would I kill now? Because <laughs> Elizabeth Taylor, Michael Jackson, and I convinced Marlon Brando to go get a bypass, stomach bypass. But we didn't realize how damaged this guy was and, and ill health. He was 380 pounds. So they did the bypass and his kidneys and everything closed down and he died. So it uh, was a sad thing. But uh, you know, it's so crazy to think of all these people I had the privilege of meeting and, and, and acting. Did you ever see the movie Any Given Sunday? That was one of my movies. I produced that movie. 38 movie stars. I, got, I even got Charleston Heston to come back. He played the Ag Aglipoo from the uh, NFL. And, you know, I, I, just, I got Moses coming. You know? <laughs> and, and the funniest story is uh, Anne Margaret, I've known in 100 years, and I had to get, cast somebody for Cameron Diaz's mother. And so I call her, her husband, who I'm friends with, and he said, no, she's not working anymore. He said, Johnny, between you and I, she's an alcoholic. I said, I wrote this. I had them write it, that she's an alcoholic. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I want her to come drunk. I don't care. Because she could say anything she wanted. It was perfect for the scene. So the next time when you watch it, you're going to see her slurring her words. She wasn't acting. That was hers. <laughs> we just bring her everywhere. I get her some wine. Hurry up. And that was it. <laughs> Got a question for you right back here. Please. <clears throat> oh, hi. As you know that the executives at Paramount were very leery about Coppola, bothering him about this and bothering him about that. What was your reaction? Did you feel, this guy knows what he's doing. We're going to be okay. Or what was your reaction to being directed by him? Since obviously it came out that he was, they were nervous about hiring him for the job. 
Well, they, that, you know, that was his second movie to direct. I mean, it was major. And nobody wanted him. Nobody wanted this guy to do it. But he never really directed anybody. He would talk to us, and he wanted us to be ourselves, which I think came out on the screen. People were really, they got so into their characters that they looked believable. Like me, I'm not even an actor. And, you know, I, unfortunately, I used to watch my father abuse my mother, which is the worst thing you could have to do as a kid. And I left my home, as I told you, six, at six years of age, never went back. But I recall that. So I, I think the authenticity of everybody being who they're supposed to be, they really weren't acting. You know, it's, but uh, I, that's why the result of the film is so good, I think. Great question, though. Thank you. Got time for a few more questions. All right, any other ones? I got to ask you, how long did it take you to write the book? Oh, you, I never mentioned you never the guy. Answered the, that's sorry. why I kind of went back a little bit. Oh, and yeah, tried please, to back yeah. In. in fact, I'm having dinner with him tonight. I, w I wrote the book, and, and Frank Wyman of the literary group, now the Folio Group, is probably the best writing agent in the world. And he came to me, and he said, uh, we have a request for you to write a book. I said, from who? And he gave me the, you know, the publishing house. I said, okay. I said, I don't write. I, I, I went to school. I mean, I'm a literate. I'm, I'm, it's funny, but... Uh, I write phonetically. People around me know what, when I send them something. I'm happy with the smartphone now. Everybody thinks I went to school now because it's all the, to do my correct spelling. I'm writing letters to people now. But um, so, you know, I just wrote the book. And then they, a, a Dan Moldea, great author, had a book out about Clinton during that time. And he approached me. Gay Talese, Nick Pileggi. These are all the people who are going to write with me. And I said, I don't want to mean any disrespect to any of you. I said, but I need you to... Who's Johnny Russo to you? You're going to write my life. This is what he's talking about. I said, can you write a small synopsis of who Johnny Russo is? And Dan Moldea walked out of the room. <laughs> he was so insulted. I'm Dan Moldea. I said, great. But what do you know about Johnny Russo? You're going to write my life story. A, a cop from my neighborhood on Mott Street, he's about five or six years younger than me. He gets on the job. I knew his father. He had a bar where everybody hung out. He gets to be a, a detective in organized crime. And the last 10 years of his life, his goal was to arrest me. He always thought I was doing something wrong. He was right in a way, but I not he was going to catch me. So <laughs> he became, he, he works at the university out here. He lives out here. He retired. He teaches writing at one of the universities. Pat Picciarelli is on the book. And we're writing three more books right now. Together, we got a, a deal. I, I turned them down. I said, I don't want to write another book. So they said, we'll give you this amount of money. I said, maybe I'll write another book. And then my, my agent said, we want a two-book deal. I said, yeah, we want a two-book deal. Now I got a three-book deal. So you're going to hear more of Hollywood Godfather 2, 3, and 4. And it's going to be fun. That's awesome. Congratulations. I mean, uh, do you write in the morning? Do you write when it suits you? Do you, I mean, I, the I, writing is more disciplined, I think, than anything. I, I mentioned that Pat lived out here. I thought it was in the witness protection program. Where he lives, I don't even know where it is. It's like eight hours to get there. And when I told him I was coming, he was so enamored. Because he, I haven't seen him since two years ago when we had the book signing in New York. We write on the phone. I can't write. He records everything I say. And then he goes into story form, which, you know, I can't even take, say I write. I dictate a book. <laughs> oh, no, you're going to be heading back to your table now and do some more signatures and oh, yeah, photo ops and all of that? I'll be here until Sunday. It is so awesome to have you here. Can't no. thank you enough. No, we have thank a, you. Do we have a last minute question before he goes, though? Last minute question? If not, you can ask him at his table. I'm sure Mr. Russo has plenty of stories to tell. Oh, my God. Thank God. And thank you all. I really appreciate oh. the attention. And God bless you all. And Merry Christmas. Yes, back at you.
congratulations. Thank you for being here. And give it up for Gianni Russo. Hi, this is Michael Shanks, and you're watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. The fate of the universe may depend on it. And have fun, and follow your fandom.